This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa. S I R O I S. Dot com. The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket by Edgar Allan Poe. Chapter 10. Shortly afterward an incident occurred which I am induced to look upon as more intensely productive of emotion, as far more replete with the extremes first of delight and then of horror, than even any of the thousand chances which afterward befell me in nine long years, crowded with events of the most startling, and in many cases of the most unconceived and unconceivable character. We were lying on the deck near the companionway, and debating the possibility of yet making our way into the storeroom, when, looking toward Augustus, who lay fronting myself, I perceived that he had become all at once deadly pale, and that his lips were quivering in the most singular and unaccountable manner. Greatly alarmed, I spoke to him, but he made me no reply, and I was beginning to think that he was suddenly taken ill when I took notice of his eyes, which were glaring apparently at some object behind me. I turned my head, and shall never forget the ecstatic joy which thrilled through every particle of my frame, when I perceived a large brig bearing down upon us, and not more than a couple of miles off. I sprung to my feet as if a musket bullet had suddenly struck me to the heart, and stretching out my arms in the direction of the vessel stood in this manner, motionless, and unable to articulate a syllable. Peters and Parker were equally affected, although in different ways. The former danced about the deck like a madman, uttering the most extravagant rhodomontades, intermingled with howls and imprecations, while the latter burst into tears and continued for many minutes weeping like a child. The vessel in sight was a large hermaphrodite brig of Dutch build and painted black with a tawdry gilt figurehead. She had evidently seen a good deal of rough weather, and we supposed had suffered much in the gale which had proved so disastrous to ourselves, for her foretop mast was gone, and some of her starboard bulwarks. When we first saw her she was, as I have already said, about two miles off, and to windward, bearing down upon us. The breeze was very gentle, and what astonished us chiefly was that she had no other sail set than her foremast and mainsail, with a flying jib. Of course she came down but slowly, and our impatience amounted nearly to frenzy. The awkward manner in which she steered, too, was remarked by all of us, even excited as we were. She yawed about so considerably that once or twice we thought it impossible she should see us, or imagined that having seen us and discovered no person on board, she was about to tack and make off in another direction. Upon each of these occasions we screamed and shouted at the top of our voices, when the stranger would appear to change for a moment her intention, and again hold on toward us. This singular conduct being repeated two or three times, so that at last we could think of no other manner of accounting for it than by supposing the helmsman to be in liquor. No person was seen upon her deck until she arrived within about a quarter of a mile of us. We then saw three seamen, whom by their dress we took to be Hollanders. Two of these were lying on some old sails near the forecastle, and the third, who appeared to be looking at us with great curiosity, was leaning over the starboard bow near the bowsprit. This last was a stout and tall man, with a very dark skin. He seemed by his manner to be encouraging us to have patience, nodding to us in a cheerful, although rather odd way, and smiling constantly, so as to display a set of the most brilliantly white teeth. As his vessel drew nearer, we saw a red flannel cap which he had on fall from his head into the water. But of this he took little or no notice, continuing his odd smiles and gesticulations. I relate these things and circumstances minutely, and I relate them it must be understood precisely as they appeared to us. The brig came on slowly, and now more steadily than before, and— I cannot speak calmly of this event, our hearts leapt up wildly within us, and we poured out our whole souls in shouts and thanksgiving to God for the complete, unexpected, and glorious deliverance that was so palpably at hand. Of a sudden, and all at once, there came wafted over the ocean from the strange vessel, which was now close upon us, 
a smell, a stench, such as the whole world has no name for, no conception of, hellish, utterly suffocating, insufferable, inconceivable. I gasped for breath, and turning to my companions, perceived that they were paler than marble. But we now had no time left for question or surmise. The brig was within fifty feet of us, and it seemed to be her intention to run under our counter, that we might board her without putting out a boat. We rushed aft when suddenly a wide yaw threw her off full five or six points from the course she had been running and as she passed under our stern at the distance of about twenty feet, we had a full view of her decks. Shall I ever forget the triple horror of that spectacle? Twenty-five or thirty human bodies, among whom were several females, lay scattered about between the counter and the galley in the last and most loathsome state of putrefaction. We plainly saw that not a soul lived in that fainted vessel, yet we could not help shouting to the dead for help. Yes, long and loudly did we beg, in the agony of the moment, that those silent and disgusting images would stay for us, would not abandon us to become like them, would receive us among their goodly company. We were raving with horror and despair, thoroughly mad through the anguish of our grievous disappointment. As our first loud yell of terror broke forth, it was replied to by something, from near the bowsprit of the stranger so closely resembling the scream of a human voice that the nicest ear might have been startled and deceived. At this instant another sudden yaw brought the region of the forecastle for a moment into view, and we beheld at once the origin of the sound. We saw the tall stout figure still leaning on the bulwark, and still nodding his head to and fro, but his face was now turned from us so that we could not behold it. His arms were extended over the rail and the palms of his hands fell outward. His knees were lodged upon a stout rope, tightly stretched, and reaching from the heel of the bowsprit to a cathead. On his back, from which a portion of the shirt had been torn, leaving it bare, there sat a huge seagull, busily gorging itself with the horrible flesh, its bill and talons deep buried, and its white plumage spattered all over with blood. As the brig moved farther round so as to bring us close in view, the bird, with much apparent difficulty, drew out its crimsoned head, and after eyeing us for a moment as if stupefied, arose lazily from the body upon which it had been feasting, and flying directly above our deck, hovered there for a while, with a portion of clotted and liver-like substance in its beak. The horrid morsel dropped at length with a sullen splash immediately at the feet of Parker. May God forgive me, but now for the first time there flashed through my mind a thought, a thought which I will not mention, and I felt myself making a step toward the ensanguined spot. I looked upward, and the eyes of Augustus met my own with a degree of intense and eager meaning, which immediately brought me to my senses. I sprang forward quickly, and with a deep shudder threw the frightful thing into the sea. The body from which it had been taken, resting as it did upon the rope, had been easily swayed to and fro by the exertions of the carnivorous bird, and it was this motion which had at first impressed us with the belief of its being alive. As the gull relieved it of its weight, it swung round and fell partially over, so that the face was fully discovered. Never, surely, was any object so terribly full of awe. The eyes were gone, and the whole flesh round the mouth, leaving the teeth utterly naked. This, then, was the smile which had cheered us on to hope. This the... But I forbear. The brig, as I have already told, passed under our stern, and made its way slowly but steadily to leeward. With her, and with her terrible crew, went all our gay visions of deliverance and joy. Deliberately as she went by, we might possibly have found means of boarding her, had not our sudden disappointment and the appalling nature of the discovery which accompanied it laid entirely prostrate every active faculty of mind and body. We had seen and felt, but we could neither think nor act, until, alas, too late. How much our intellects had been weakened by this incident may be estimated by the fact that when the vessel had proceeded so far that we could perceive no more than half of her hull, 
the proposition was seriously entertained of attempting to overtake her by swimming. I have, since this period, vainly endeavored to obtain some clue to the hideous uncertainty which enveloped the fate of the stranger. Her build and general appearance, as I have before stated, led us to the belief that she was a Dutch trader, and the dresses of the crew also sustained this opinion. We might have easily seen the name upon her stern, and indeed taken other observations, which would have guided us in making out her character, but the intense excitement of the moment blinded us to everything of that nature. From the saffron-like hue of such of the corpses as were not entirely decayed, we concluded that the whole of her company had perished by the yellow fever, or some other virulent disease of the same fearful kind. If such were the case, and I know not what else to imagine, death, to judge from the positions of the bodies, must have come upon them in a manner awfully sudden and overwhelming, in a way totally distinct from that which generally characterizes even the most deadly pestilences with which mankind are acquainted. It is possible, indeed, that poison, accidentally introduced into some of their sea stores, may have brought about the disaster or that the eating of some unknown venomous species of fish or other marine animal or oceanic bird might have induced it. But it is utterly useless to form conjectures where all is involved, and will no doubt remain forever involved in the most appalling and unfathomable mystery. End of chapter 10